Welcome inside the WOSN studios. It's time for another edition of Press Row, and we are joined, as always, by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Baseball and softball draws are out, guys. We know the route that each team is going to take to regionals should they get there. Do you see any surprises coming our way? Which team might surprise us in a, with a run to regionals, baseball or softball? Well, that's always a good question because mm -hmm. a surprise is a surprise, so we don't know about them. <laughs> right. You're not going to predict any surprises? Well, you know, I think on the softball side, uh, Harden Northern has a pretty good yeah. team, and they don't yeah. really get much pub. Yep. Uh, yeah. And in Division Four, I think that that's a team to keep your eye on. I don't know that you'd call it a dark horse or a surprise, but uh, that's one that came to mind for me. But uh, th these are always tough questions because if you really are surprised, you're not going to have any idea at this point. But I think sometimes you get an idea that some teams are being overlooked or underrated, and I guess that's one I'd throw out there. Hard Northern will strike out 20 and give up a hit, and they'll be good. <laughs> you win most of those games. Yes, they do. Yeah. You know, speaking of softball, I think the Elida softball team might mm -hmm. be uh, one of those teams that's getting a little bit overlooked. They did finish second in the WBL. Michaela Black, a, a pretty good pitcher for Elida. And you, we, we know what's going to be the path for that division, too. You know Bath, if you know Shawnee, you know Elida, you know Wapak, you know Salina. They're all going to be in that same Miller City district and it's going to be a slugfest between those WBL teams to get to be Cyrus from the regional. I think Elida maybe could be a, a surprise team out of that quartet. I think a grind when you look, let's switch to baseball for a second guys, that D3 at ONU. It mm -hmm. looks like that's going to be a real grinder as well as that has become when it was at UNOH and now transitions to ONU this year for the second straight season. You look at that draw, you've got Coldwater, you've got Ottawa Glendorf, St. Henry all in there and St. Henry and OG are on the same side of the bracket. You've got Coldwater on the opposite side as the defending champion. I think that one could be a very, very intriguing uh, draw for the districts uh, when that comes to fruition. If I remember correctly, Coldwater beat St. Henry in the district final there last year. Correct. In a very good game, and uh, that could be on, on track for that. Any other baseball teams, or we'll just leave it there? Well, you could maybe throw defiance in that category because of their record. They, they lost some games this year that perhaps the, they don't normally lose, but I don't know if defiance making it to the regionals would really be a surprise for anybody. Neither would Bath girls making it to regionals in softball either. That wouldn't just, just no. based on the tradition aspect and what these programs have been able to do and sustain for many years, you know, whether it be old coaches, coaches that have been at it for a while, whether it be a new regime that's come in, wins a state title in their first year like Bath did last year with Hannah Slavin. But, you know, that, that's a team that wouldn't surprise me if they get out of that district and makes it to the regionals as well. I'm going to keep my eye on some of the MAC baseball teams, Versailles, Minster, Parkway. I think they've all had pretty good seasons. Yeah, and I, I think Minster is one of those teams that's really peaking at the right time, perhaps. Right, which is always, that's always a big part of it. So we'll keep, keep it on St. Mary's, too. And St. Mary's, they, yeah, some big wins for St. Mary's already this year. I could see them parlaying that into a run to regionals. We'll have to wait and see, just like you. Looking forward to watching. Let's go to the NBA now and game one. The Bulls defeated the Cavs, and obviously Love is out for the remainder of the postseason. Is this a sign of things to come where the Bulls are going to breeze by Cleveland, or is Cleveland going to going to make this a series? Well, you know, I think a lot of that, it, you always overreact in the first game. I think you saw the effects of the Cavs having not played in a little while. They looked a little discombobulated. Mm -hmm. Plus, they've got to go on now without Kevin Love. The worst thing about that is I think they were finally – figuring out how to get the best out of him as part of the group overall. That's the most unfortunate thing to me. But, uh, you know, I think Chicago's capable, but I think Cleveland really let that game get away early and then had to keep coming back and keep coming back. I think if they win game two at home, they should be okay. Uh, but don't ever panic over one game in a, in a seven-game set. I'm not panicking over that first game, but you could really tell, and I can't believe that I'm saying this, meaning the importance of J.R. Smith yeah. and what he means to this Cavalier team and how him missing game one and then we'll miss game two tonight as we tape this, how he was not available, and now they're moving Tristan Thompson into the lineup tonight for game two. I think that's a, they should have done that in game one, but instead of having you know him come off the bench, bring him in and back and, you know, put him on the back line with Mozgov and go from there. But they have got to come out better. They cannot get down 15 like they did early. And I think that was part of it. Like Todd said, you know, they had to play catch up that pretty much that entire game for, you know, 30 some plus minutes of that contest. Who's the Cavs head coach? I knew we were going back to this. Oh, yes. I'll give him a pass on this one. I'll say in it, fairness, taking the, to. having the week off, it's always difficult to get your team back right. in. 
But I will point out this fact, though. They had that full week off knowing they were going to have J.R. Smith and knowing they were going to have Kevin Love, and they still came out flat. You'd think you'd use that week to work on that rotation, maybe move Tristan Thompson into the lineup to begin game one instead of having to see what happened in game one before you make that move. Well, ultimately, that was the mistake I think David Blatt made. The starting lineup was wrong, and I think they fairly well admitted it after the game. Uh, we've got to change this up. And let's not overlook LeBron James. I mean, this is his team. That was not a great effort by him in game one. Not that I would blame him for the loss, but he's got to be a notch better now. We talked about that last week, and he was not. If he isn't a notch better than that, they're going to have problems. And LeBron has had issues in the past against Thibodeau defenses. Yep. Especially in game ones. His team's lost, I think, yeah. three in a row now. But his teams have always come back to win. So... We'll see what happens. Another interesting stat from that game one. First time in LeBron's career where he is, his team has not mm -hmm. led in a home playoff game. Uh, another big part of the series is obviously Derrick Rose, and he had a huge game one and then kind of got banged up towards the end. I think he'll be fine to continue on, but another thing to watch as this series plays out. Staying in the NBA, Steph Curry named the MVP, so not LeBron James. Is this a sign that voters are tired of voting for LeBron, or was Steph deserving? Best player on the best team in the NBA, Steph Curry this year, point blank. Look at what the Miami Heat did without LeBron. Look at what the Cleveland Clav Cavaliers did with LeBron. If that's not a huge argument that LeBron James is the most valuable player in the league, I don't know what it is. You're talking about a 17-game slide for the Heat, a 19-game improvement for the Cavs with one guy moving? And I think LeBron, had he got it, it wouldn't have surprised me. I just, you know... Steph Curry, in my opinion, this year, I, I the think best Le player and the best team. I think LeBron is getting the Michael Jordan treatment of the mid-90s, the late 90s. The, well, we can't keep on giving the guy the award every year. I guess that had more of the early 90s because the mid-90s he wasn't in yeah. the league. In the late 90s, everybody was fawning over him He was playing double-A and buying buses for That's games. right. <laughs> and failing miserably, <clears throat> proving baseball is not an easy sport to play. But anyway. I was at his first game back, by the way. The first time. Wearing number? 45. That's right. Ed fact. Neely was the first bull or was the last bull to wear 45 prior to MJ and Pete Myers is still mad that Michael Jordan came back yes he is with all that being said <laughs> I think uh, Steph Curry deserves the award and I think LeBron probably did too but there's no question that voters get in that well we can't do it four or five mm -hmm. years in a row which I don't see why but uh, I think I think I might have voted for Curry over LeBron you know your analogy about his two teams is applicable if Nothing else had changed. I mean, right. if he had come to the old Cavaliers team, but they didn't make any other changes, I don't think they yeah. win 56 games or whatever it was. But you also look at the change Cleveland made internally during the season and the way LeBron impacted. Because let's face it, the, the first half season, the Cavaliers weren't what they were once they made those deals midseason and lost right. a headband too. Ball party unity. <laughs> Common argument with the MVP is – are they the best player in the league? Are they the most valuable to their team? Like, if right, you have a fantasy right. draft, who are you – Because like, then still... you'd have people saying James Harden, Russell Wer right, Westbrook, right. I mean, if you have Anthony any choice yeah, yeah, exactly. of any NBA player for one year, I mean, you know, if you're building a franchise, Anthony Davis is an enticing pick, but I still pick LeBron mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Steph Curry did what he did for Golden State, not taking anything away from him, and he's deserving of the MVP as well. Can Mike Conley get some retro votes just for what he did <laughs> wow. this week? No <laughs> kidding. Boy. Yeah. How do you play with a broken face? That's my Mike that's Conley tough. does. Yeah. You know, you, you hear about breaking ankles all the time. <laughs> yeah. Done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You broke your ankle, not somebody else's. Right. That's clear. Exactly. Exactly. That's what Steph Curry kept doing to Chris Paul anyway. That's part of the, those highlights were amazing. And then that, I'm sure, could have played a role in his MVP votes. All right, let's go to baseball now. The Indians, will Nick Swisher make a difference for the Tribe? And this up and down season for the Indians so far, and more down than up. Your boy, Bro Ohio. Bro Ohio. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, if he's fully healthy and can produce like he did a couple years ago, absolutely. Do I think he is? Probably not. I, I don't think this will have a huge effect. I hope it does. I like Nick Swisher. I think it'd be a, a great story for him to come back, start producing again. But, you know, the, the recent track record doesn't give you a lot of faith that that'll happen. I mean, historically, Swisher's been good for about 25 homers, 70 runs driven in every year. He is the talent of his career. I don't know if the production on the field is going to be there anymore, but I think the way, one area where they sorely n missed Nick Swisher in the month of April was the leadership, just being with the team every day in the clubhouse. With the last couple of years, we heard a lot about how Swisher and Giambi were the leaders of that team. Sure. Giambi's gone. Swisher wasn't around. 
If they were there in April, would have been a better start? Who knows? They're not out of it completely yet, but I think they, they need Swisher to, to kind of rally around those young kids and, and get them back focused on winning baseball. That's where I was going to go with this whole scenario as well, Mark, was, you know, in that clubhouse, you know, picking up these guys, especially when they start out 8 and 15 for a team that was predicted not just by Sports Illustrated but by others to hit, a either go to the World Series trying to sell win magazines. the World Series or you know make a deep playoff run maybe win a division but right now this team needs all the help it can get if Swisher can provide that I think that will help them long term I don't think so I think he's on that tail end but he's a guy that could you know from the positive mentality so to speak he will help that team in that regard all right so let me ask you this is it time for the National League to add the designated hitter? Or is it time for the American League to mm. let the pitchers hit again? <laughs> We're never going to see pitchers hit no. again in the American no. League, unfortunately. I, you know, about 20, 25 years ago, you might have been able to get that debate going. But if, if there's going to be a change, it's going to be bringing the DH to the NL. I think eventually it is going to happen. I, I think it will, too. I, I hope that it doesn't. I think it's great for a baseball player to be able to play baseball, which is – defense and hit, offense and it's a, it's a novel concept i know but uh, eventually it'll probably filter into the national league but you're seeing more and more american league teams going away from that old designated hitter role that harold yeah. baines that eddie murray at the end of edgar his career martinez. edgar <laughs> martinez there's fewer and fewer victor martinez's and david ortiz's out there where we are seeing more american league managers using the dh role to cycle a guy off to get a fourth outfielder some at bats using it more in that role. So that argument, I don't know, holds as much as it used to be. Uh, the, bro, the throwback is going to be the, well, what about pitchers? Pitchers should be allowed to hit. Pitchers don't play four days out of the week anyway, so right. who cares if they're not hitting? You can talk a lot about Bud Selig's history and his legacy, and certainly one of the, I think, underrated aspects of what Bud Selig's legacy in Major League Baseball is going to be is he completely obliterated the old American League, National League, offices, presidents, they were very much right. separate leagues 25 years ago. Yep. Now it's just one big league, and that's why I think eventually the designated hitter is going to come so in. So it would make yeah. sense for them to have the same rules, but what I don't want to see go away is the strategy involved of if Matt Harvey or whoever, your ace, I'm a Mets fan, so obviously I went right to Matt Harvey, but if anybody, your ace, is pitching a good game and it's the seventh inning, you got a runner on second, two out, he's at the plate, are you going to take him out of the game to send up a pinch hitter, or are you going to leave him in and – and that's the type why, of strategy that the American League. Why should you, why should you make that decision? If you have the designated hitter, you allow your pitcher. The game. The you allow the pitcher to pitch. Way. You allow the pitcher to pitch to do his job. But as Todd said, the pitcher needs to do both parts I, I, of his job and also hit. He's no, playing Todd, baseball. Todd was saying that the batters need to field. He didn't say about the pitchers needing to hit. What did you say, Todd? <laughs> the pitchers need to. I hit. think the pitchers should hit. Yeah, it's part of the because game. they are baseball players. Right. But no, they're I also, pitchers. <laughs> <laughs> Babe Ruth ain't they're, walking through that locker room anymore. <laughs> John Olerud gave up pitching when he came to the major leagues. They turn, they turn pitchers into kickers now. That's all they do is kick. <laughs> Don't get me started right? on kickers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think just the culture of sports, the culture of the game, that DH, I'm, frankly, I'm surprised it has lasted this long. Mm -hmm. But you got to realize the designated hitter came in in 1972. But it had been talked about long before then. True. That's I, I'm still, I would have thought, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have thought it would have already happened. So the fact that it hasn't does give me some hope that it won't. But uh, if I had to say will it or won't it, i say it will eventually come to the National League. It will eventually come, but you'll have, you know, these guys like Travis Wood. I'll use him from the Cubs as an example. Guy can hit. Yeah, good hitter. Uh, you know, he's used as a pinch hitter. He's used to the, as a pinch runner. You know, so he's not just, you know, spending those days off doing different things. He actually takes BP every day as a prime example of, some, of a pitcher who can actually go and can be used in certain situations. Imagine how good he'd be if he just focused on pitching. No kidding. <laughs> but he knows it's part of the I'm game. I'm sure he so pitches he, every day, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, he might not. They yeah. might not throw every day. But they yeah, being I, the arms the way they do. It's going to happen eventually. Well, I, the injury, I truly think. Yeah, the injury to Adam Wainwright really has burned this discussion again. Well, and, and Max Scherzer yeah, got yeah, sure. and there are, yeah, a couple, right, couple different injuries to the pitchers. And when you're paying Scherzer what you are, and, and Wainwright, yeah. and all of these pitchers, you don't want to see them get injured. Batting. But, you know, part of the game, and it's a debate that will continue to rage on. That's all the time we have for Press Row today. Thank you for joining us on the West Ohio Sports Network, and we'll see you next week.